Good afternoon, and, or good morning, and welcome to NCCAT's Sigma Particle Short Course. Today we're moving on to the fundamentals of Kari, and we're going to backfill a lot of the conceptual parts that we're talking about, learning about Sigma Particle in general, tools of the trade, and now getting more theoretical background. Our guest speaker today is Fritz Gorth from Yale University. He actually started in Yale in his graduate work and returned there in the departments of, oh, three departments, cellular and molecular physiology, biomedical engineering, and MVP, one of my own mom daughters. So something that is really appropriate is why in these three different departments. As we've noticed, if you go back to literature, Fritz works in the field of cardiac doing a lot of different things, from local resolution of the density maps, actually solving membrane proteins in a liberal environment, and also working on a lot of statistical methods to process through that. And if you ever hear Shore speak, he also credits with Fred for looking at maximum likelihood as one of the algorithms that can be brought to bear on a single particle problem. So without further ado, Fred Sigworth. Great, thanks so much. So I'm going to attempt the impossible today, which is to start from total basics and end with maximum likelihood um, reconstruction and classification. And um, I'm a little uh, embarrassed or nervous because I thought I would start really at the way at the beginning with, um, with complex numbers and then use these complex numbers to talk about wave functions and then we'll talk about interference of waves in the microscope giving you the focus contrast. And that motivates then a little bit about Fourier transforms and do you want to hear a half an hour about Fourier transforms? I see an alarming number of people <laughs> nodding their heads. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so, uh, so the first hour is going to be uh, those basics of uh, Fourier transforms, and then the second hour is going to be um, going from all of that knowledge base to how do we get clean images from noisy images, how do we do reconstruction, and so we're going to attempt the impossible. All right, so, uh, so we have to start with complex numbers because unfortunately complex numbers are used all over the physics literature and over all of the main concepts that we use for um, uh, imaging electron microscopes. And uh, the main thing is that complex numbers are an extremely useful bookkeeping tool and we're going to use it for that too. So complex numbers, of course, are just a number that includes an imaginary part and so that it's a real and an imaginary part of a complex number. And uh, you can do things with complex numbers. You can add them. There's a formula for multiplying them. We talk about the real part and the imaginary part. The absolute value is uh, uh, the, sum, the root sum of squares of the real and imaginary parts. And there's something called the conjugate, which is kind of cool because in physics, you, if you conjugate the wave function of the universe of run, time runs backwards. It's, uh, it, uh, it's a reflection operation. Um, oh, and uh, well, that's for a class, so I'm not going to make you do the, the whole work. Okay, so uh, we all know the exponential function. This is a very famous function in mathematics and physics, and so when you say e to the x, there is this, um, there's this expansion where e to the x is this infinite expansion of terms. And um, a very uh, important approximation that we're going to use several times today is that if, if you look at e to the x when x is something that's very, very small, you can take just the first term of the expansion and we say that e to the x is very close to 1 plus x when x is really small. Now the reason I'm talking about e to the x is that there is this uh, uh, there is this thing called the complex exponential function. That is, if we ins if we say e to the x where x is actually a complex number, then interesting things happen. E to the imaginary number e to the i theta is equal to uh, cosine theta plus i sine theta. So here is a here is a cosine function. Uh, uh, this is where theta is zero and it's equal to one, and it oscillates with a period of two pi. 
and uh, here's a sine function which uh, is shifted uh, by a quarter of a cycle by 90 degrees at zero at the origin. So whereas the cosine function was what we call an even function, it's uh, mirror symmetric. The sine function is what we call an odd function, it's anti-symmetric about the origin. And e of the i theta contains both of these. And this is where the bookkeeping uh, property of complex numbers comes in. That uh, a whole lot of things can be expressed as uh, sums of sine and cosine terms. And if we use the complex exponential e to the i theta, we get both in one. So uh, e to the i theta, because it has a real part and imaginary part, uh, um, uh, being the cosine and sine functions, it actually, if you were to plot it, uh, 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 plot it as a function of theta, where you're plotting the imaginary part and the real part, the thing is a spiral. And so if you look at it, if you look at the imaginary part, this here is a, is a cosine function. And if we, uh, if we rotate it so that we're looking at the real part, then it looks like a uh, cosine. So we can represent any complex number uh, in either of two ways. We can say, well, it's just uh, the uh, it's just the real imaginary parts, or we can talk about the magnitude and the phase of the number. And uh, uh, the way we do it is this: here is uh, here is a plotted on the real and imaginary axes. This point is a comma b, or we can talk about its distance from the origin and the phase angle. And uh, here's a here's an interesting property. Uh, maybe you remember that um, if you uh, multiply two exponentials, you just sum their exponents. So when you multiply two complex numbers, the phases just add. So that's a very useful um, property of using this magnitude and phase representation. Okay, so uh, uh, so. Uh, I said we can do, I don't know why I have this slide here, but it's, uh, uh, we don't need all of these. I already talked about all these properties, and that's, that's the end of that show. Okay, any, any questions about complex numbers? And then I'm going to uh, go and dive into using these for defocused contrast. To clarify, all these are on the website, so you don't have to try to scribble everything down right now. So if you go on our website right now, you can see that. So now I want to talk about uh, defocused contrast, and we're going to make sure we're going to make uh, heavy use of what I just told you. Okay, so uh, you all know probably better than I do that uh, defocused contrast is the way we get images on the electron microscope, and the the more we defocus, the stronger the signal we get, but the more distorted the signal. And uh, um, it turns out that the focus contrast only gives us half of the signal that um, we really ought to get in the electron microscope, and only half of the signal that you can get in focus of the phase plate. But it seems at the moment to be the best way to get high resolution information. So we have to talk about um, we have to talk about electron waves and. Uh, the physicists go and say, well, the wave function psi is this complex exponential where we have k, which is the prop propagation constant times z, I have z increasing downward here. Uh, and then there's a time dependence to it. And uh, I'm representing complex numbers in using this kind of scheme where uh, uh, as you go around the circle, the phases change, the colors change. So, Here's a, a representation of some electron waves. And if you think about it, in an electron microscope, um, the, the beam intensity is pretty small. You have a, about one electron per nanosecond uh, making it all the way through and hitting your detector. And um, how far does light travel then? Uh, how, how far does an electron at near the speed of light travel in a nanosecond? Anyone know? About, about this far. 
So that means that electrons are going through the column of the microscope pretty much one by one. And so what we're going to be looking at is not uh, this whole cloud of electrons uh, interfering with each other, but we're going to be looking at one electron at a time, its electron wave going through the imaging system and interfering with, uh, with itself. So we're going to ignore time dependence, and so we'll get rid of the time dependent part and we'll just uh, take a snapshot of time of our electron wave. And we're going to introduce uh, a, a, a phase object, a phase break. We're interested in phase contrast for the same reason that cell biologists are interested in phase contrast. So when you look at a cell, a cultured cell in, the, in a light microscope, you don't see anything if you're in focus. You have to either go out of focus or use a phase contrast device to see it because the cell doesn't really absorb much light. All it does is it changes the phase of the light waves that go through it. And it's the same thing here when when uh, an electron wave goes near an atom, uh, its phase gets uh, shifted in positive direction slightly. And the reason is that when the electron goes near the nucleus, it experiences a positive charge. And that positive charge then causes the electron to speed up a little bit, and then it slows back down after it's away from that field. And in the end, it's made a little bit of a phase shift. In the, Order of magnitude of a phase shift electron going uh, going past an atom is like on the order of a milli radian, so very small phase shift. So, uh, so this is a simulation where I, I introduced a, a, a fairly small phase shift in the electron waves, and the big question is, what's going to happen to these electron waves as they propagate down away from the, uh, away from the gradient? better uh, representation. So uh, right below my phase object, um, my electron wave is, uh, is the original electron wave multiplied by a phase factor. And uh, so I'm calling this I epsilon P of X. And this P of X is going to be a cosine. It's going to be a, a phase gradient. And now we're going to make use of that Taylor expansion trick already in a very important approximation called the weak phase approximation. We're going to say that epsilon is really small, and so this exponent is really small, so we can get by with just uh, saying that uh, the wave function is actually uh, the original wave function plus a modified one that um, has, this, uh, has this epsilon period, period distance. And the reason for doing that is that now we can talk about um, the uh, unscattered and the scattered wave. So to, uh, to, to uh, give you a hint of what's going to happen is that if we look at the intensity, that is the magnitude squared of the wave function, as a distance below our specimen, you can see that there are there's a place where there's no contrast. That's right at the right at the specimen, and then some large distance away, there's a lot of contrast, no contrast, a lot of contrast. And so you can see that if we could if we could map out the electron wave intensity at all at all places below the specimen, we could get this repeating pattern. So because uh, because of the weak phase. Um, uh, weak phase approximation, we can now talk about um, the effect of our phase grading as producing, um, as producing uh, a scattered wave. So we start off with, a, with, a, with just the plain electron wave, the unscattered wave, and then we know from just classical diffraction theory that we get a new wave that, is, uh, that propagates at, a, at, a, at an angle theta, and sine of theta is lambda over so, for example, if lambda is 0.02 angstroms, like 300 kV electron, and let's suppose that D is 2 angstroms, then sine theta is 0.01, uh, and theta is about half a degree. So we're actually going to be talking about very small angles, but I'm going to draw bigger angles here so that we can see them. So, uh, in fact, 
the, the complete description says we have our unscattered wave and we have these two scattered waves that I call psi plus and psi minus and the two scattered waves are uh, go off of, uh, go off of in um, uh, nearer, nearer directions. So what I want to do is I want to ask uh, what happens as far as interference among these waves. And we can see that there's got to be an inter interesting interference uh, situation because if we look here, um, all three waves sort of converge uh, in, in these vertices, but if we look down here, uh, all those three waves do not converge in the same vertices, so there is something happening to cause a phase shift as we move down below the specimen. So I'm going to uh, so this is what I showed you before. This is how the intensity of the, of the uh, electron waves changes with displacement below the specimen. And these are my two uh, scattered waves. And what I'm going to do is I'm now going to think about a, um, a representation where I'm going to get rid of this original e to the i k z. That is the oscillation of the unscattered wave. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm just going to say, what's the total wave function? divided by the unscattered wave function, and this is what it looks like. It's one, that is the unscattered wave, and then here is my psi, um, here's my psi plus, and here's my psi minus, and those are the, those are the two scattered waves. And uh, this is now, in my uh, phase color scheme, a picture of the entire wave, of the, of the total wave below the specimen after I it, it's a picture of that, and you can see that it's kind of uninteresting. It's all red, which means um, it's one, and it, and it uh, differs a little bit from red, and if you're really careful, you can see some colors in here, so there's a, a little bit of phase changes going on. But what's a, a, a nice thing to do now is we get rid of the unscattered wave and just look at the scattered waves uh, relative uh, here with the original IKZ. Um, we moved, and, uh, and, and, and this is what we've got. So uh, right below the specimen, we have blue and yellow. That is, uh, the waves all, are, uh, all uh, have imaginary values. And as we move down, uh, we move to a region where we have, um, where we have red and green values, that is, Real values of, of, of this uh, wave, of this interfering wavefront that we get, and now it's imaginary again, and here it's real. Um, and that turns out to, uh, to be the reason that we're going to get contrast is because these imaginary real values combine with the unscattered wave to give us contrast. Um, so I want to, uh, let me just show you how we get from here to here because that's the, that's the crux of the argument. So we have uh, our uh, psi over psi naught uh, is equal to one plus uh, these two scattered waves. Um, All right, so uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, the first thing uh, that I need to tell you is that uh, 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 S is the sign of the angle of theta, which we said is lambda over, um, uh, lambda over the diffraction gradient spacing, and K is equal And 
And so uh, these two terms here, I can separate them out and just say, you know, this is this equal to um, that plus that. These two terms are both uh, oscillating with this period of 2 pi over with this period d. So this actually came from the period this being upon creating. And I'm adding together <coughs> either the i something along with e to the minus i something. What is that? Well, remember that um, e to the i something is equal to the cosine of that thing plus i sine of that thing of that thing. So in this case, we're adding together um, e to the i something e to the minus i something. When we add them together, what happens is that this term vanishes because uh, because the sine function flips sine when you when you go from plus theta to minus theta. This one does not. And so this whole thing here is just equal to you know, this is just equal to epsilon cosine of two pi. So that's my gradient. This is my signal. This term is my signal. And so what I have is a, uh, my, my wave function is then, uh, it is then what you see at the top. I have this IE and the IC minus one. Um, uh, what I have at the top is this thing. That is this thing and this cosine thing. All right, are you with me? Uh, please, when I make a blunder, speak up and um, uh, if you don't like all the math, look at the pretty pictures. <laughs> so you can see what's, uh, you, you, can, you can see that this term is happening because as you look across uh, at, any, uh, at, at any level of z, you can see the cosine pattern uh, winding up in the interference of those two waves and that interference is precisely this thing. All right, uh, so um, physicists tell me that um, that the intensity of electron beam, that is the probability of getting a count on your electron detector, is proportional to the wave function squared. So I want to talk a minute, uh, a little bit about that. So, <clears throat> um, so what we need to do is we need to calculate what what the magnitude squared of this. Well, we know that the magnitude squared of some complex number is equal to the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. So in this case, we're going to be looking at the real part and the imaginary part squared. And uh, let's try to separate this into real and imaginary parts. So the real part uh, is going to be one, and it's going to be whatever is the real part of this complex exponential, which, uh, if I am not making any mistakes, is going to be a sine of c minus 1 kc. And, uh, and then the imaginary part is going to be um, i uh, cosine. So now I need to tell you what is what is c. So <clears throat> c uh, c is cosine theta. Uh, 
squared, which means it's equal to 1 minus uh, the sine theta squared, uh, which, mean, which by approximation is it's about equal to uh, 1 minus 1 half of s squared. And uh, so finally, if we put all those things in and remember that uh, s is lambda over d, let's see what we get. So this is 1 minus 1 half of uh, lambda. And then, uh, so for complete, uh, 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 so to completely understand this, what is the C minus one case? C is remember the cosine, <coughs> cosine part of that of that scattered wave. And what we have is we have the the phase of this wave advancing at a different rate than the unscattered wave, and the difference is going to be this C minus one. <clears throat> so C minus 1 times AC is equal to, well, there's a, we get rid of that 1, and so it's going to look like um, 1 half lambda squared over lambda squared times A, which is 2 pi over lambda, which is all equal to pi uh, lambda. is equal to pi lambda uh, uh, c over d squared. Okay, so uh, the, the, uh, the, the intensity, the magnitude squared of our wave function is going, is, uh, is going to be the magnitude squared of this thing. And so the way that we get uh, the way that we get uh, the magnitude squared is going to be is going to be the real part <coughs> squared plus the imaginary part squared. And so in our case, the real part is <coughs> one minus uh, sine. And now we now we fix what this argument is. This is sine of, of uh, something that I'll just call chi. <coughs> And uh, so I take this thing and I square it, and I take this other thing, which is uh, cosine of pi uh, squared. And I'm going to define pi is my friend here. Okay, so uh, the whole uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, So the whole trick here is uh, thinking about <coughs> what's going to happen in the case where epsilon is really small. Or this is now the second place where we're going to use the weak phase approximation. We're going to say that the amount of signal that we have, that is the amount of phase shift that is created by the stress point, is really small. And so uh, if you go and expand this, um, uh, this guy, I goes and turns into the following. Phi squared is, uh, is equal to uh, 1 minus 2 sine phi times phi signal epsilon uh, plus another term which is on the order of epsilon squared. <coughs> that's, the, that's the first part. Uh, plus, uh, so that is that is what this guy turns into, because I'm just saying uh, 
I have two terms here. I have a one and I have this whole thing. And so when I go to square it, I can do one minus two times that times the square of that thing, right? I'm just not bothering to write the verbal square of that thing. And uh, the other term here, this is the square of the, of the imaginary part, is going to be uh, the square of something whose magnitude is epsilon. And so this one is something really small because it's on the order of epsilon squared. So, uh, so that's what's happening here. As we, uh, uh, um, as we move away from the specimen, as we go below the specimen, we can see that there's a sinusoidal variation in contrast. <coughs> And that's because uh, my the intensity, <coughs> I'm going to just erase everything that's, that's of order up to long squared. The intensity is 1 minus 2 times sine of pi plus this uh, times the uh, times my original, uh, times my original optic, uh, my original gradient. So out of uh, um, out of laziness, everyone in the field gets rid of that too, and we just say the contrast is the sine of pi times our original phase grading signal, which is epsilon. Times. And so that thing is going to turn into our our contrast transfer. Now we're going to uh, change two things. I'm going to say, well, let's this define spatial frequency as one over um, that. That should be a square there. Spatial frequency is just one over the gradient spacing. And I'm going to change uh, and define the, the focus not as the distance below the specimen, but the distance above the specimen. So we start out, here's a picture of my grading, if I could see in phase right up here. And I'm, in this panel, I'm going to show you what the, what the image would look like um, if we were to look at various planes below the specimen. You can see so the image gets strong, it gets weak, it gets strong again, and when it passes through one of those reversals, it, it, the grading shifts over, and that's because the polarity of the contrast is changing as uh, in the same way that you would see from this from the sine curve. Now, uh, the trick is that uh, this still works when we are above, when we focus above the specimen. Okay, so you're not going to like this. <coughs> here we have our microscope. <coughs> here we have our specimen. Down here is an objective lens. The objective lens is focusing electron waves from some plane where it's focused down to an image plane. And what it does is it actually reproduces the, elect uh, the electron wave function perfectly, except that it's expanded in x and y, and, it's, and uh, the field is also expanded in the vertical direction. But we can say that the lens um, copies, a, uh, copies a plane up here to a plane in and the lens is sitting here and it sees the specimen there and so we understand what happens. We can focus at some place below the specimen. And what happens when we focus above the specimen? Well, all the lens sees is it sees wave fronts. And so the correct way, or let's say the thing that the, that the lens sees is the wave fronts as if the wave fronts just continue to, um, continue to in free space develop in the other direction. So that's what I did here. Was I uh, I, uh, um, <coughs> I I computed the wave functions down here, but I also I just said, okay, computer run things backwards. What would be the waves above the specimen that would give rise to the waves below the specimen? And that's what those are. And then if I then if I look at a plane up here, I get I I, I get interference and I and I get a signal. 
And the, the reason for making a deal of this is that when you are doing focus in your microscope and taking data, you are under focusing. You are focusing above the specimen. And, and, so, uh, and so you're already making use of science fiction in, um, in, 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 in taking the data. OK, so, <coughs> um, so what I plotted here, of course, is the intensity is a function of of distance below here, and I'm making use of the, of the fact that um, um, uh, this sine function depends on depends on uh, the, the, the position. But the other way we can think about it is how this um, how the sine function depends on uh, uh, depends on the focus. So uh, going into the um, going into the This is the terminology I used for the first part of this lecture. This is the terminology that everyone uses. And the difference here is that I don't use the, the spacing squared. I use the spatial frequency, S squared. And I don't use um, Z below the specimen. I use delta, which, on, which is what we call the focus, which is flipped and sign and it's actually the distance above the specimen. So we just convinced ourselves that there's going to be the sinusoidal variation in contrast below or above the specimen. But the other thing we can do is that we can freeze the level of the focus and ask, well, how does the contrast vary with spatial frequency? And that is our, our friend, the contrast transfer function. So, uh, so here's, uh, here's this chi function, and this is the contrast transfer. This little alpha, this is one way of representing so-called um, uh, amplitude contrast. And what it does is it says that uh, even at, um, it, even even when s is 0, you get a little, tiny bit of contrast due to um, uh, the loss of electrons through high angle scattering or any other sort of absorption process. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and so there's a little bit of contrast that I did not show in that curve from there. And this would change the amount of the focus and change these oscillations. You've seen these, right? You've seen the oscillations of the contrast transfer function. So if we think about it, so we have this lens and it's focused at, at uh, it's focused at some place, and in our case it's focused a little bit above the specimen. Uh, the lens forms an image down here, and, uh, and there's a special place called the back focal plane. The back focal plane is a place where, um, uh, uh, where the unscattered beams uh, converge. So for example, uh, this line in the middle here is, is an unscattered ray. The lens spins it, and it brings it together with the other unscattered ray in a point. So this is the, the back focal plane, there's a very intense spot, which is where the unscattered is focused. Now imagine that this is my psi plus, and this is my psi minus, minus this is psi plus, and this is psi minus. So psi plus, is, you can imagine, is a wave front that is parallel to this and that line, and so it's going down at an angle. Where does it get focused? Uh, uh, yeah it gets focused at another spot in the back focal plane. And uh, the psi minus, uh, meanwhile, gets focused at another spot in the back focal plane. So I just convinced you that interesting things happen among these waves uh, uh, as they interfere with each other below the specimen. But back here at the back focal plane, we actually have those three waves now represented by individual spots. Uh, um, in the uh, oops, uh, in individual spots in this so-called diffraction pattern or the pattern in the diffraction plane. Then, uh, then what happens in the optical system is after after separating those waves, then they get uh, focused again and they interfere again down in the image plane. 
So it's very interesting. So I've been talking about all this interference, but this interference isn't something irreversible. It's only irreversible at the point where you're detecting the intensity of the detector. And so in this back focal plane, we very nicely have the unscattered and the scattered waves separating. And uh, that's how phase plates work. The phase plate changes that one in the, um, in the wave function into an I. It shifts it by 90 degrees, and that changes the whole form of the contrast transfer function. So what we do is we put an object here, that uh, a, a device that shifts the phase right at that uh, of the unscattered wave, and doesn't shift the phase of these two scattered waves, and so we can modify what the contrast transfer function does, because we're thinking about really the contrast transfer function. So people have tried to make lots of different kinds of phase plates. So the so the one now is made of very very clean thin carbon film, and by mechanisms that are not well understood, the very intense unscattered beam um, deposits probably some kind of impurities on the film and charges them up, so it gets an electrostatic charge, and the electrostatic charge happens to be about the right amount to uh, shift the phase of the electrons going through that spot. And uh, a tricky thing about this so-called Volta phase plate is that the longer you expose it to the intense beam, the more and more charged up it gets, and so the phase shift that it imposes changes with time. And so that's one of the hassles of working with the Volta phase plate is that uh, you have to um, you use it for a while, and then you have to move to another place because that spot is deposited so much gunk there, or somehow charged it up so much that it shifts. Okay? Yeah? So we, so on your focus, yeah. in electron microscope, yeah. but that doesn't seem <coughs> absolutely necessary. You could over-focus. So why under-focus? Is it like a physical? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get it, get it. I'll tell you okay. in a minute. I'll okay. tell you in a minute. Okay. So, um, now, uh, Electron lenses are not very good. They have um, they have aberrations, and the the first aberration that one has to take uh, take account of is so-called spherical aberration. And there's nothing spherical about um, about an electron lens, but spherical aberration is just the next order aberration. What it says is, if you have uh, if you have an electron wave scattered at a steep angle, then uh, then uh, that wave gets focused to a uh, get, gets focused at a point uh, here, which is um, above where the focus would be for a, for a rays coming down at narrow angles. So it's it's as if the uh, strength of the lens varies on depending on um, how big the angle is. And now, of course, big angles you get from fine diffraction gratings, and so. In effect, what happens is that the, the, um, the defocus is modified on, um, I forgot to write something here. Uh, there's a term S squared in there. This is so, this is so egregious, I'm going to fix it on the spot. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oops, except that it's on that screen. <laughs> uh, this is going to be an interesting, uh, uh, interesting thing, so we'll do. Did that work? Yeah. Look at that, miraculous. Okay, so, uh, uh, so the, the fact that the, it's as if the lens's focus changes with the angle of the ray and therefore the spatial frequency s. And so it's as if the, uh, the, the focus changes in this way. Cs is the spherical aberration coefficient. Um, uh, lambda, of course, is electron wavelength, and that's the spatial frequency. 
And so the overall CTF uh, begins to look like this. Here is, uh, here is the interference of the electron waves below or above the specimen. Here is the spherical aberration uh, uh, trick. And then there's this little bit more from amplitude contrast. So uh, this is what a real CTF function begins to look like. First, there's a little bit of contrast at zero spatial frequency, and that comes from alpha. Uh, then we get our oscillations. And then what happens is that this spherical aberration term starts to kick in, and the oscillations stop. In fact, the oscillations are going to uh, stop and then start going in the opposite direction. So, um, so the CS works against the defocus. And so this is now the explanation of why we like to underfocus the lens. The, the reason is that this term and this term both help us if we are underfocused. Uh, the reason is that by underfocusing, we get this minus sign here. We take off in the negative direction. The uh, amplitude contrast also has us going in the negative direction. And the uh, spherical aberration um, works against the oscillations and so actually makes things a little bit easier in compensating for the CTF at high spatial frequencies. So that's why we like that. Okay, we have now, uh, I think, uh, given you a plausibility argument for how the contrast transfer function works. Yeah? Uh, I guess this is a question I always have, and I think all the students have the same question. So, how can we diffraction Yeah. Gradient spacing. I can tell you what the image of any object 
just because I know about the board of And I think I think I ran out of time for this. For this, the first part. For this first part. And then you're going to move to the second uh, part. But yeah, I just give a couple minutes. Yeah, OK. about what the glass lens does is it <coughs> is it slows down if if we now think about a grading it slows down the unscattered wave and does not slow down the scattered waves the scattered waves go out at an angle go through the thin part of the lens and so the so the lens is messing with the phases in the sense of slowing down the unscattered wave now the focus slows down the, the scattered waves. They travel a, a path at an angle, so they don't, their phase doesn't change as quickly in the z direction. So, the <coughs> uh, so if you just think about the propagation and free space of the wavefront below a grating, you get, you get this pattern where the scattered waves are slowed down. And the way a lens can form an image is that it undoes that. It slows down the unscattered wave and brings all the waves into, in, into focus again. Okay. So on, in an electron microscope, how does that, how is that issue? So is it like the magnetic field in the middle is strong? Oh, okay. So you want to know how the how magnetic lens works. So, um, you have these magnetic you, you have these magnetic fields and an electron and and uh, uh, there's a hole in the middle of the lens magnet right so if an electron goes straight through the middle it uh, it really doesn't see anything it goes straight through okay but an electron that that uh, comes in at an angle right uh, it uh, the uh, um, it's cross product rule. The magnetic field is going like this and the electron is going like this, the electron gets pushed in that direction. <coughs> and so that's what's happening is the electron is if the electron is coming down as it's hitting the magnetic field and getting to Okay. Now um, what does that do to phases that will we need to be doing this to increasing the Modifying the phase of the, of the scattered waves, and now the scattered waves sort of take this take this extra path through the lens. I'm not sure. I, I haven't thought about what that what that means. It's sort of wave function. Terms. Yeah. Yeah. So then, why would the focal plane remain the same? 
it removed the objects because most of the objects, the scattered waves which are hitting the lens, yeah. they are at a different phase yeah, than right. the ones which are on That's the right. So they're gonna That's right. Change. That's right. So, uh, you know, a diagram I wanted to make is uh, uh, sort of. Very heroic. Right? <laughs> You're being very heroic. I, I didn't give you an easy job. Well, uh, so I have a problem which is that I'm already way behind. Uh, and so I want to just quick see how I can make things really simple. All right, so I'm going to, um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I got bogged down in these uh, wave functions. I didn't make, didn't make really good slides for them. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. behind Fourier transforms is that we can build up any kind of function, any kind of uh, distribution by adding a sine and cosine waves. So for example, um, let me try to reconstruct the Gaussian function. So here's, here's a little, uh, little Gaussian function. And what I can do is I can uh, add a, uh, add a uh, individual cosine waves uh, weighted by uh, weighted by uh, a certain amount, so I can add them up and I can get something that's really indistinguishable from my original Gaussian just by adding up cosine waves um, in the right proportions. Now, uh, you should be asking me, well, how do I know what those coefficients should be? What are those proportions? And the answer is that um, if I take my original Gaussian function and I run it through the purple box called the Fourier transform, um, I get uh, something that is, uh, the, uh, I start with this uh, g of x, I get out this g of u, where u is a frequency coordinate, and those coefficients that I used in that previous uh, drawing are just samples from this g of u. So we would say that this is a function, and that is the Fourier transform of the function, and Gaussians are really cool because they're the one case where a well-behaved function is Fourier transformed into the same function. So the the transform is actually uh, is actually uh, this nasty integral. We take the original function, we multiply it by one of these complex exponentials, whose frequency depends on u, 
And then we integrate out all of the x values, and then we get something that depends on u. And the inverse transform is almost exactly the same. It's just uh, there's just a complex conjugation here. So um, here's how we would compute g of u. So uh, this is my original uh, function g of x. And uh, this is cosine of 2 pi u x. And um, uh, I'm going to not go in, not belabor it here, but the complex exponential, remember, is cosine plus i sine. Uh, if this is an even function, like a Gaussian, then uh, it turns out that the odd part of the complex exponential is going to um, get canceled out. So the sine part gets canceled out because uh, that's, that's symmetric, and the anti-symmetric part coming from here is going to get integrated out because we integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity. So that allows me to, um, to say that I'm going to compute the integral of g of x times just the cosine function. And I'm going to ask, what is the integral of its product, or the area under that curve? And so what happens is, uh, if I go and ask what's the area under the curve, I get, uh, when u is 1, I get something pretty close to 1. And as I go to um, higher and higher u, what happens is that these oscillations begin to cancel out, and the net area becomes really small, and um, uh, faster and faster. And these are the coefficients that I needed. I just get them by multiplying the original function times the cosine wave and, and, um, and, and integrating the result. Um, so uh, I'm not going to do this. But anyway, the Fourier transform of e to the minus pi x squared is e to the minus uh, pi u squared. Now here's another example. We're going to reconstruct a rectangular pulse function. So this is called the rect function. And uh, so we start uh, going and adding up uh, cosine waves. Again, this is symmetric around 0. So the, we only have to use cosines of doing the integral. And you can see that, um, you can see that uh, as I add together more and more terms, well, uh, it gets better. But I still have these oscillations. These oscillations remain there. And in fact, um, this is a terrible property of the rect function is that this Fourier transform is something that oscillates a whole lot. This thing is called the sink function. And it's kind of infamous. What it means is that if you have something that starts out with sharp edges, this Fourier transform is something that just kind of spreads out you know, for over long distances. Uh, so the Gaussian and the rect function are actually probably the most useful um, kind of model things to think about it for your transform. Now, what happens if you, um, if you squeeze a function together? So for example, here I took my favorite Gaussian, and I squeezed it to half the width and twice the height, so I preserved its area. Well, it turns out that its Fourier transform <coughs> gets spread out by a factor of two. And you can see how this would happen, because you know, remember, we're getting these, co these coefficients here by multiplying our original function times oscillating cosine. And when this is narrower, uh, uh, when this is narrower, then my cosine can oscillate quicker, and I can still get a substantial amount out of the integral. And, uh, oops. Uh, oh. Um, and so. This is, the, this is the math for doing that. Uh, you squeeze something and make it taller by a factor A, then you spread out the Fourier transform uh, by a factor A. And so what happens is that as we make this, uh, uh, that as we make this narrower and narrower, the Fourier transform becomes flatter and flatter. Now what we've done here is we've made uh, we, we've made something called the delta function that's really really tall, maybe it's infinitely tall, and it's really really narrow, maybe it's infinitely narrow. And the interesting thing is that the Fourier transform of the delta function is one. Finally, uh, 
finally, I wanted to talk about the shift property. Suppose I take my favorite Gaussian function and I shift it uh, on the x-axis by uh, map B. Uh, now this thing is no longer symmetric around zero, so I can't just throw out the sine part and just use the cosine part of the complex exponential. And when I go and I actually do and calculate it, I get this complex uh, exponential multiplying the original transform and this complex exponential is what you could call the it's a phase shift. The shift here in space turns into a phase shift there. And here are three renderings of the function that comes out. It's a spiral if I plot it in a, a real and imaginary uh, axes. If I color according to phase shift, I get this very beautiful colored Gaussian. And uh, here, if I color it according to uh, intensity is magnitude and color is phase, then I can represent it in that way. So the shift property changes the phase shift. Finally, I want to talk about a really important uh, property called the convolution. I'm going to do this really quick because we're not going to use that much of this, but here's a convolution. Um, convolution works, uh, works this way. We say that uh, uh, we have some function. Um, we, we have some, two functions, g and H and, uh, and and people denote convolution by a star, and this is what they do. Uh, here's my function g, and I'm going to make the g as a function of s, and uh, this is my function h, uh, and this is uh, going to be my uh, output function. Turns out that f of x is going to be an integral uh, g of s h of uh, x minus s. And here's how convolution works. In this case, the convolution is going to be a smooth version of that. So we can say this might be our object, this might be a point spread function. This is the result after we've gone to this point spread function. The way this works is. Uh, we take a point here on G, G at some value of S, and I use that to scale the, all of the values of H and, uh, and then make a copy at this position in my output function that looks like this. And then I take the adjacent point here and I make a copy of this shifted over slightly until I get, a, get another one of those little Gaussian or another one of these little copies of H. And so these little copies of H get added together and they result in the, in the output waveform. So convolution is this process where you take the value of an input and you use it to make copies of this, um, this function which is called the kernel and out comes the, uh, out comes the result. We're going to use this. We're going to say, OK, uh, here's a representation of an object. Uh, this is the contrast transfer function, and this is the resulting image. We're going to make use of convolution. And convolution has this um, really cool property, which is helpful theoretically, but is uh, absolutely a huge uh, advantage to people doing image processing. And that is this complicated integral of convolution. Uh, turns into just the multiplication of the Fourier transforms. Okay, so uh, um, uh, um, if we had time, I would say, okay, we have gotten Fourier transform pairs, and we've we've worked on properties of Fourier transforms, and this this is this is the really cool one, but these are the other ones that I uh, these are other ones that I talked about. Okay, we immediately want to go to two dimensions because we want to work on images and we want to go to three dimensions and we want to go to, uh, we want to, go to volumes. So 
Uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to build up a two-dimensional Gaussian function out of individual components. And in this case, the individual components are, uh, are in this case, these are cosine waves. So that you can have a wave moving in the x direction, or the y direction, or the diagonal direction. And so I can add up more and more of these wave components. And as I add up, and, and as I add up more and more, I get a better and better approximation of my original Gaussian. And uh, this is a representation of the coefficients where I've just shown the coefficients on a very slow. So, so this is the function, and that's this is a representation of its 2D Fourier transform. Except that, well, I'll, I'll show you how this uh, I'll show you how this works. So the 2D Fourier transform is the same kind of thing. We just integrate over two space variables. We get two frequency variables out, and we have a complex exponential. And we'll represent complex numbers using this scheme again. So, uh, so for example, uh, um, here's the equivalent of our rect function is um, is we get uh, a product of two sig functions. If we start out with two rect functions, um, this is a, this is another one. This is a circular disk, and uh, there's a shift property, and so. As I said last time, shifts produce phase shifts. So if I, so if I shift my circle over, I start getting all of these colorful phase shifts. So the Fourier transform pattern stays the same, but phase shifts occur. And uh, same thing if I move in the other direction, we have phase shifts occurring in the other direction. So uh, convolution is really nice. So I, we can take an Im a, a two-dimensional image compute its Fourier transform. And so now what I'm doing is I'm doing a representation where the point in the center is zero frequency. And as I move out, I get higher and higher values of u. <coughs> so uh, convolution says uh, I could take this and copy this kernel for every point in that image and sum them up. And I'll get the blurred image because I have a point spread function that's it's blurred. Or I can do this all using Fourier transforms. So I get Fourier transform and just multiply it by that. I get something that is more restricted to the center of the Fourier plane, and I do the inverse transform. I get that. So the surprising thing is that there is a really, really, really good algorithm for doing Fourier transforms on a computer. So believe it or not, it's faster to do this, 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 this operation than going straight across by orders of magnitude really when you're operating on the energy. But that's just under the hood. You can also do convolution with a lattice. It turns out that a lattice has a Fourier transform that's another lattice. And so if I take this, <coughs> there's its Fourier transform. I'm going to multiply it by the lattice. And so what I get is a sampled Fourier transform, sampled at discrete points. And when I transform it back, I get copies of my original motif on the lattice points. And this is a, now a situation that people call aliasing. If I change my lattice uh, so that I'm sampling at fewer points in the Fourier in the frequency domain, then when I transform back, well, I get copies of my original, but the, uh, the, uh, the, the original unit cells are now overlapping. Before, I could cut out a unit cell, and I, and I got my original object back. Here, I cannot cut out the original. Now, I can't cut out a unit cell, because there's interference from, the, uh, from neighboring unit cells. This is, a, this is a, uh, either a feature or a bug, you can say, of, um, that's called aliasing. And people talk about aliasing. That's what's, this is an idea of what's going on. So all of this works in the other direction. If you if, if this were in the frequency domain and that were in the spatial domain, that's all we saw Okay, so I think I I I think um, y'all can Frank told you about this very important thing called the Fourier slice theorem. Yes, it just says you know so your here's your body and a cat in a in a cat. Uh, scanner in the hospital, take a projection uh, using x-rays. Turns out your body, uh, the density of your body slice uh, in, uh, also has a Fourier transform. 
And it turns out that the Fourier transform of this projection is exactly the same as a slice of the 2D Fourier transform, and uh, here's how it works. Projection is just integral along a particular direction. Uh, this is the 2D Fourier transform, and this is the 2D Fourier transform evaluated at, one, at B equals zero, and it's just the projection uh, uh, Fourier transform. And then there's a rotation property that I didn't tell you, which is that if I rotate this, its Fourier transform rotates. So uh, a primitive CAT scan machine would then put you inside of you would be rotated as it's shown the x-rays to it, and the computer says, aha, now I have a uh, rotated Fourier transform, but that, what that really means is my slice is going to be it's a different slice of the 2D Fourier transform. And so, uh, so anyway, we can build up a complete Fourier transform by getting various slices by taking projections in various You've probably seen this, and so the, uh, so the way, for example, you would do a 2D, uh, a 2D reconstruction from 1D projections might look like this. You have your object, you compute a 1D projection, for a transform, and you insert it as a slice. And um, uh, if you did the inverse transform to see what you got, well, it would just look like uh, a, a back projected, not uh, a, a, a back projected um, projection. But uh, if we start to uh, rotate our projection direction, then we could fill in other slices and we could fill in more and more and more slices. Here we are halfway filled and we're beginning to see our object uh, with actually the big missing wedge artifact. And there it is where we filled in essentially all of the 2D transform and we've got a pretty good one this way. So that's how that, this is the slice theorem, which is the, uh, which is the heart of all, uh, all of our 3D Uh, there's something called the discrete Fourier transform, and um, uh, that's really how I did these calculations on the computer. And you should, you might have the question, well, so I just take a grayscale image that is 32 by 32, and I compute its Fourier, Fourier transform, and it's 32 by 32, but it has a phase angle at each pixel. You know, it's this colored thing, and so where the information come from? turns out that uh, the information is redundant in the, uh, in the Fourier transform. The real part is symmetric, and the imaginary part is anti-symmetric. So there's actually the same amount of information in one of these colored Fourier transforms as in a black and white image. Um, and so, uh, the 3D Fourier transform is just the same thing, but Okay, so that was very quick, and I hope that was useful and not just uh, boring people who knew it all and confusing uh, people who didn't have any, any questions. So, yeah. All right. Okay, so now we can finally get to the meat of uh, uh, taking our ugly single particle images and getting something out of it. So the model of an image that I'm going to use is to say that um, there is a there is a uh, platonic ideal image that I'll call A, that is sort of the, the true motif or the true, true object. I am going to operate on it by the contrast transfer function, and I'm going to add noise to it. So here's, here's what the contrast transfer function, of course, does. So here's A. Here's the Fourier transform of A. Here's the CTF. Uh, red means positive and green means negative. So this is actually upside down CTF. Anyway, I multiply those two, and then I transform back, and I get my horrible looking defocus contrast image of my object. And, um, the Fourier transform of the CTF is a point spread function. Uh, so if, if, you, if you're uh, familiar with working with point spread functions, uh, that says every point on here gets spread out into a pattern like that. So 
that involved with that is that you can see that there are a couple of things that happen when we uh, when we make the focus contrast image. So the image looks awful. And the other thing is there are these fringes extending some distance away from the image of the object. Those fringes come because high state, high frequency components of the object act like a high frequency grating produce a diffracted ray that goes off at some angle. And it's that angle, the, that diffracted uh, wave that goes off at an angle that um, uh, winds up producing a, a fringe out here. And because the diffracted waves go off at a particular angle, the more you defocus, the more this delocalization happens. The more these fringes extend out from the out from the image of the object, and actually, the more um, uh, the, the the more space um, the, the the more space you have to include in the box of your particle image to include all of those fringes, because the fringes contain your high frequency information. Okay, so uh, now what we'd like to do maybe is we want to. Um, uh, we want to get back to uh, seeing what our actual object looks like. So one thought is, well, um, if we're working in the Fourier transform domain, we know that this operation, operating on the true image with contrast stress function, just a multiplication. So why don't we do a deconvolution? All we have to do is to take, uh, is to take this thing and divide it by the contrast transfer function, and I'll get a nice estimate of the original image. Wouldn't that be cool? Why can't I do that? There are zeros in the contrast transfer function, and, uh, and there's noise in the image. So together, those produce a catastrophic situation. Okay. The computer will complain about the division by zero, and uh, if it didn't, then the, the noise would still be blown up at those frequencies where the CTF is zero, and so we have to do some kind of trick. So one trick is uh, we can get rid of the worst of the extended point spread function by doing uh, phase flipping. That is, we take our original image and we just multiply it by one or zero, depending on the sign of the CTF. And you can see that now we get a better representation of our original particle, but notice there are still fringes. And in fact, the fringes extend now out twice as far as they did if we didn't do the face with it. But um, our transform uh, looks somewhat better, and uh, you can begin to see your object better. A really cool way of doing the con deconvolution, we can't divide by C, so here's what we do. We we multiply by c in the numerator, and we divide by c squared. Okay, so that's just like dividing by c, but to keep things from blowing up, we put in a, a constant. This is, uh, this is called a Wiener filter, and the constant is called a Wiener filter constant. And so this is, uh, this is an example of a Wiener filter version of that, where, um, uh, uh, where the zeros in the CTF are beginning, the places where the CTF starts to get small, um, this denominator gets small, and so we amplify uh, signals from the image. And by picking the constant right, we can make a pretty good reconstruction. Now, we can also use the Wiener filter, but uh, use multiple images, maybe with uh, multiple different CTFs. And so we can do the same kind of thing. We can make a fancy Wiener filter where we're combining multiple images. And that's what this is. So this is where I took um, now uh, uh, 100 uh, noisy images with the focus between that and that the value. And I added them, uh, added them up according to this uh, uh, multiple image Wiener filter. And I got that very nice. A nice representation of the original. So uh, this is just comparison. This is three micron defocus. That's uh, that's a simulation of, of a particle in noise. This is what phase flipping does. This is what a single particle Wiener filter is capable of. And then this is uh, what we get when we 
can combine information from multiple images at multiple defocus levels. Having multiple defocus levels means that we can fill in zeros in the CTF from one image with non-zero parts in another image. Okay, so in the next, uh, next part, I'm going to use two kinds of notations for pixels in an image. I, in one notation I have, I just sort of say, okay, here's my 100 by 100 pixel particle image, and I'm just going to have J go from 1 to 10,000. That will enumerate all the pixels. And in, in the other case, I can talk about a pixel at a particular position in the image. We want to be able to compare images. We want to compare uh, an, an image with a reference. And so we just say that here a reference is, uh, is, is a true image multiplied or operated on by the contrast transfer function, and that's this thing, R. So if I want to ask um, how similar is X and R, I can look at the squared difference, where I just take the pixel differences and square them, and so the square difference is big if the images are different. If we expand that square, we see that uh, an important part of it is what amounts to a multiplication of X and R, and, uh, and and we call this uh, correlation. So this is pixel by pixel, we multiply an X pixel by an R pixel, and that gives us the correlation. Now, you could say, well, the correlation is <coughs> gets big when X and R are come from the same original motif, but you can take it out. You could say, okay, I'm just going to uh, have extra contrast in my X. And so when I do that multiplication, I'll get twice as big correlation. And so I can get led astray uh, if I have different sized uh, either X's or R's. So one nice way to do that is we do normalization. We divide by the um, magnitudes of X and R, and we get something called a correlation coefficient. Now, one way that correlation is nice is, uh, is when we can uh, go and ask, where in the micrograph X do I find a, uh, a, a motif like my uh, reference R? And that's what this cross-correlation function does. It asks us what vector X and Y takes the reference to match the, uh, match, uh, the object I'm, I'm interested in in, um, uh, I'm interested in, in the micrograph. So, Here's an example. This is uh, this is a homemade simple particle picker. So here's a micrograph. Here are a bunch of particle boxes. There's a box. Uh, uh, it's a particle taken in, in error and there's some other errors here. But this is a correlation-based particle picker. So here's part of the image. Um, what, in order to get each of these particle locations, what I did was I looked for a maximum in the cross-correlation cross map uh, gotten by taking a particular reference and, up and correlating it with the, uh, with the entire image. I actually used a whole bunch of references, and so I selected which reference correlated the best at any given point. But you can see the problem with the correlation function is that not only did I pick out this particle, which is reasonable identification, but we, I also got really uh, big signal in the cross-correlation map from this ice from this uh, ice block. So I have to do something about that. And uh, in, in this little particle picker, what I did was I made about 40 other references that are designed to look like ice blobs. And Anywhere I discovered an ice blob, I don't have this uh, actual particle. So anyway, so that that's an example of how one can use correlation. Now here's another way of comparing images, which is that I'm going to ask, <coughs> um, what is the probability of observing an image that came from the noiseless image R? And we're making use of, the, of this model saying, well, my image is a noiseless image plus some um, independent random Gaussian noise that we're adding to it. So let's start out thinking about an individual pixel. So let's take the J pixel of X and 
ask, what is the probability that um, this j pixel value of x uh, came from the j pixel value of r? So uh, this is now a histogram of possible measurements that we could have gotten uh, uh, for x if the true value is r. So true value is here, but we have noise. So x could take on any value anyway, anywhere x could take, take on uh, any value along there. And uh, this is a Gaussian probability curve. So I'm saying that the noise is Gaussian. And so the probability of getting any of these other values is, uh, is given by our reading it off of this Gaussian probability curve. So there's a spread of x values uh, that are consistent with the given underlying true image pixel value. So uh, this is what the this is what the map looks like. This is the Gaussian function. This is the normalization of the Gaussian function, and this W is the finesse uh, precision of my measurement of intensity. So if I'm saying, that, do I get, for example, exactly the same intensity values? Well, that just means that x of j falls within this particular bin. And the probability of then observing the entire image, all I have to do is multiply these probabilities for each pixel. And because the noise, I'm assuming, is independent, that is, the counting, the counting statistics for one pixel, my detector, are, are independent of the counting statistics for the next pixel, then all I have to do is take the product of this over all of the j's, and I get something that looks like this. I'll take every pixel in the image minus every pixel in the reference, uh, square them, take the sum of the squares, and uh, it, gets, it gets divided by sigma squared, which is the variance of the noise. And uh, here's my normalization. And uh, this is now the product of these w's, this uh, pixel measurement finesse now raised to the j power over j is the total number of pixels. So you can imagine that uh, this, this whole number is going to get to be really, really small. It doesn't help us that we have j and we have w, which is a small number raised to the j power. Now, everyone just throws away this term. I don't know if I my animation shows this. Everyone throws away this term because it's small because we don't care. We're always going to have the same uh, same electronics measuring pixel intensities, so uh, so we can ignore that. Uh, even so, this this probability can be kind. It gets to be really small because this number can be so. This number kind of grows as the number of pixels. The this does not grow as the number of pixels, and so we so this exponential uh, term gets to be really small. Okay. More probabilities. <clears throat> so uh, now I'm going to do this notation where, uh, where P sub C means this is taking a projection of a particular volume in a certain projection direction, P, and that gives me my true object. The probability of finding an image, of observing an image, now P of X given the volume and the projection angle P is just the same thing we just saw. So it's X minus the true motif, which is C, P, V. And uh, everything else is the same. That's my normalization. And uh, so this is now a very interesting thing is the probability of I actually get my image given an underlying volume. And then I can say, well, what's the probability of P being the correct projection direction given my image and given the underlying volume? And it turns out that it's the same thing with the normalization where I, uh, where I integrate over everything. So this is, this is the thing that we just calculated. This is P of P. This is prior information. This is saying, suppose I know that my projection directions do not include this missing cone or this missing wedge, then I can put that information into here as a so-called prior probability, and so I can get this, this kind of probability. So the reason I told you about this is to say, okay, let's look at projection matching 
uh, in a famous data set. So here is a particle image. We think that came from an A, that is the original object that looked like that, or an R, which looked like that after operating on by the CTF. <coughs> and, uh, but let's, let's try to do uh, let's try to do projection matching. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the probability of orientations as we scan through a whole lot of different projection directions of a 3D model and try to match that with my original image. You can see in this sort of heat map of the probabilities that there's actually a remarkably sharp peak um, at a particular value, which is, I don't know which, oops, which which is, um, <coughs> which is, though I don't, uh, I, I don't know for sure, but uh, it's very likely that, that this, this is the correct tilt angle and this is the correct spin angle for the particle. So um, this is actually, to me, an absolutely astonishing thing. You can take an image, a particle image that looks like that, and you can determine by this kind of projection matching really quite precisely what the angles and orientation of the original object were. Is everyone happy so far? All right, <clears throat> so now I can tell you how free align works. <clears throat> so free align is, uh, is a uh, 3D reconstruction program that was actually um, uh, I think Nico wrote it in like 1998, uh, so long ago. And, and it was the first program that did really good CTF correction. It gave you an output volume where the contrast transfer function effects were dealt with properly. And uh, it is a refinement program. That is, you give it a uh, you give it an estimate of your volume and it gives you a better estimate as an output of this iterative process. And the iterations are the following. First, you find the projection image, which is just like what I said, CPP, so volume projected, operated on by the contrast transfer function, that matches uh, your given particle image. And uh, Nico optimizes the correlation coefficient, which, remember, is a nice way of, nice way of uh, matching images. And then <coughs> he updates the volume by something that looks uh, a whole lot like a Wiener filter. In fact, this is almost exactly the same idea as the Wiener filter for multiple, uh, for multiple images that I showed you before. Um, what he does is he says, I'm going to take the image i, I'm going to multiply it by its contrast transfer function, and in the denominator, I'm going to have the contrast transfer function squared. So these things together would, would uh, in, fact, in effect, do the deconvolution part. But I'm now going to do a back projection. So this piece of T, this uh, transpose of the P matrix, if you like that, is a back projection operator. So instead of taking a projection from 3D to 2D, this is a back projection from 2D to 3D. It's kind of like your slide projectors in a smoke-filled room, and, uh, and so your image gets projected throughout the, throughout the room. That's what it does in real space. In Fourier space, it just gives you a volume that's all zero except for a slice that's been inserted. <coughs> and then you uh, sum that up over all the images. You sum this normalization by all the images, and you put in a Wiener constant so that nothing blows up. And uh, that gives you your new volume. So that's how free align works. So free align spends, of course, most of its time doing step one, searching to find what is the best uh, projection direction uh, corresponding to given image, and then uh, combines the images in a Wiener filter way to get, the, uh, get an improved volume. Okay. Now the, the modern methods uh, are, people still use free align, it's fast, and it gives high resolution results, and for good data sets it works as well as 
the fancy with the maximum likelihood methods that I can tell you about the maximum likelihood methods anyway, because I have a captive audience. Okay, so um, uh, another definition. I'm going to let this uh, this uh, capital X be our entire stack of particle images. And uh, what I what I'd like to do if I'm going to do a statistical estimation problem is I want to find the volume that has the highest probability given my data set. So in the in the set of all possible volumes, I want to find the particular volume map that, that uh, has the highest probability of coming from my data set. Yeah, well, it turns out that I don't know how to calculate this thing. But there is something that I do know how to calculate, and uh, that is this. So uh, what I want is this, the probability of getting the data set given a volume. Uh, and Bayes' theorem says, if I do this, multiply by the probability, uh, uh, a priori probabilities of the various volumes, and I divide by the a priori probability of getting this particular data set, then uh, that gives me what I want. Well, uh, P of X uh, doesn't depend on the volume, and we want to maximize this with respect to the volume, so it turns out that this is hard to compute, but we don't have to ignore it, so we'll just set it equal to 1. All right? <coughs> P of x given d is something that we can calculate. It's called the likelihood, and P of d is called the prior probability. And the way that statisticians think about this is the following. In the beginning, we have prior information. We know that our 3D density volume has certain characteristics like has zeros around the outside or it's smooth and other sort of general characteristics. Someday we'll be able to say we have prior information that our 3D density map represents a folded polypeptide chain and so it has certain constraints just due to the nature of, of the chemistry. But anyway, I have a prior probability of, uh, of, the, of what kind of density map I'm going to get. And then I do an experiment and uh, the experiment is going to give me this, this likelihood term. And then in the end, what I do is I, is I compute this product, likelihood times the prior, and that gives me the posterior probability. And so, the, so, a, uh, so a proper way to do the statistical estimation would be we want to find D such that this posterior probability is maximum. Okay, so I'm sorry, here comes more math and more statistics, but we're going to get there. Okay, so we already know what this looks like. We just talked about that in, in conjunction with, uh, with, with um, three align. We know that x given the volume and the uh, projection angle is a normalization times this uh, Gaussian x minus CPD. And uh, um, uh, so if we know what phi is, that's what it is. Now, to get um, x given b and to be agnostic about projection angles, this is what we can do. We can do what um, statisticians call marginalization. It just means we're going to integrate out phi. We're going to get rid of phi. The Bayes theorem says we can do this. We, all we do is we take this, multiply it by the prior, integrate over all phi, and I get the probability of the image given, given the volume, probability of the complete image data set given the volume being totally agnostic about the projection directions. So this is very powerful. I don't have to know for sure what the projection directions are if I properly set up this problem because I can get P of X given P. I'm sorry, this is not the whole data set. This is one image. Now, to do what I just said, I want to get the probability of the whole data set given, uh, given uh, B. So this is now the likelihood function. I just take this guy and I uh, multiply these probabilities for all of my n images. 
turns out that uh, this quantity already is kind of small because we have an exponential with a large negative exponent, and so this is ridiculously small. So for numerical sanity, that is, for people who write programs and actually try to calculate these things, you take the logarithm of it. So this is the logarithm of the likelihood. And so this probability of the data set given the volume is what statisticians would call the likelihood of the volume given the data. So the likelihood is kind of a backwards probability. Okay, so I think you see where we're going with this. We're, we're going to maximize uh, something have, having to do with that likelihood. And in fact, um, rely on CryoSpark and any other uh, maximum likelihood type reconstruction programs, all they do is just uh, solve this equation. They find the, the V that maximizes this thing, where uh, this thing is the log of the posterior probability. Yeah. I'll show you. Uh, yeah. uh, when I show you the reliant formula, and I don't tell you. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> uh, uh, this is this is a hard problem. Okay. So what do we do? remember? What we have to do is to compute this thing. We take a phi, and then. Uh, uh, and then make a projection, and then for every pixel of x sub i, we do this comparison and exponentiation, and then we have to do this for every possible projection direction, and uh, um, add that all up, do that for each image, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to vary the vary the density in one voxel of my map while I. Uh, and find uh, and so identify the values of you know a million voxels from all of my data doing many many of these horrible inputs. So this is a <coughs> this this looks like an impossible problem, but of course there's a, there's a pretty good algorithm for it. Uh, it was invented in the 1960s and and um, nice enough it's called the EM algorithm and. Uh, um, and you'll see that this looks a whole lot like a free aligned reconstruction step. What we do is we take the image, multiply it by the CTF, we, in the normalization we have a CTF squared, we do the back projection, and uh, the only thing is that um, we're doing an integral over phi, and uh, the uh, as we vary phi, this is weighted by this function called gamma. And so gamma is basically the probability of phi taking a particular value. So instead of assigning a particular projection direction to each image x sub i, we're going to have a probability distribution of phi values for that for x sub i. So, uh, so we integrate over all phi's and then we uh, sum this over all of our images. And then uh, this is where we take care of signal to noise ratio. So um, <coughs> um, sigma squared, that's the noise standard deviation. Uh, tau squared is the square of the, the square of the um, voxel densities in the in the three D map. And uh, T is a parameter that you get to tell Reliant to use. So this is uh, this is in effect the Wiener constant, and um, so there are two ways where the signal to noise ratio of the data set are handled. So one is in these uh, in these sigmas and tau's, uh, specifically in these sigmas, and the other way is a uh, is a term that I did not put in, which is there is a uh, scaling factor I would, uh, that's in front of the C's here which represents how much contrast you have in your particular particle image. And I, um, to simplify things, I left it out, but in the same way that the EM algorithm lets you estimate the volume, the EM algorithm lets you estimate these other things, the amplitude per image, or the amplitude per group, and, uh, and the sigma squared per, uh, per group of particle images. 
And this tau squared in Reliant is, uh, so this is supposed to be the square of the uh, magnitude of the um, map values. You don't want to include the noise or any, you know, the noise and artifacts in the map when you compute that. So this is actually computed making use of the party shell part of FSC. Do you know about FSCs? Someone going to tell you about FSCs later. Later, hooray. Okay, I don't have to talk about them. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so, um, Here's, here's how gamma is gotten. Gamma is gotten by these probabilities. This is the probability that we know how to compute. And, um, and, uh, and that's how we compute it. And so when Reliant is sitting there, you see that it's spending 90% of its time doing the so-called E step. And the E step is just to evaluate, basically the evaluation of this gamma function, which is the probability uh, you know, uh, for a given image, what is the what's the distribution of, of, um, of projection angles. Okay, so uh, um, we can, we, uh, we now all, we now know all we need to do the reconstruction of a volume. Now let's reconstruct a whole set of volumes. Our, our model is to say that the given image is uh, you pick a particular volume, we'll say this is volume K sub I, that's the volume that corresponds to image X sub I. We project it and we modify it by the contrast transfer function. We give it its own unique uh, noise field and there are K of these, K of these, of these volumes. And then all we have to do conceptually is we just expand the gamma function so it includes the Ks in it. So we compute not just the probability of projection angles, but we also compute the probability that, um, that uh, uh, of the various k values, that is the probability of the various volumes associated with the given image, and, um, and, and add those together and you get then a way to um, uh, estimate each of those k volumes. Now you you probably uh, you might be a little bit worried because um, in three line what we did was we we said we have a particular um, projection direction we're going to assign it to the particle and then we're going to use that hard assignment to then do our reconstruction. And what this does is it, this is making a sort of blurry assignment. It's saying, well, you know, suppose the projection angle, the projection direction could be this or it could be this. Well, we're actually going to make a weighted mean of the result based on kind of keeping both of those projection directions um, in mind. That's the expectation part of the uh, EM algorithm. Is we're taking the expectation of the result um, over the probability distributions of the, of the fees. And, so, and uh, so intuitively you would say, well, this is going to give me a blurry result because it's blurring together um, uh, other uh, various possible realizations. But it turns out um, it doesn't give a blurry result, although in the end Reliant goes and does, does do a, a, a hard assignment. So th this is something that bothered me a whole lot when I started working with this, and I still don't quite understand it, but it works. Okay, so uh, I told you how to do 3D classification. It turns out that Shores uses exactly the same program to do 2D classification, and um, the, the way that's done is using exactly the same equations I showed you, but instead of a class volume, we just say this is a class average image. Um, the, uh, the phi now is, to, instead of being uh, five variables, it's just three variables, one angle of rotation, two translations. Uh, P is, uh, instead of being a projection, is a rotation and shift, and this is the reverse shift and rotation. So if you just plug those in, then the same formula works, and it now becomes something that looks like a lunar filter, where you know, you're taking each of your images and saying, uh, this may be a rotated or shifted copy of a given uh, one of my class averages. Let's 
uh, that's seen how it's assigned you know, its name to the various class values. Okay, that's a romp through um, the statistical estimation theory applied to a single particle. Now, um, uh, the computation is just absolutely horrendous. The integral over phi is an integral over, is a five dimensional integral. And it would take a very long time, except that Shores did some nice um, selection of what, what regions of phi he's going to actually integrate over. And so that speeds things up orders of magnitude. And um, uh, Ali Panjani in CryoSpark also does the same five-dimensional integral, but he is, does an even more clever um, choice of what values of phi he's going to use, and so CryoSpark runs even faster. They're basically evaluating the same thing, just using clever uh, choice of the domain field. Right. So uh, you know, you probably have wondered, <coughs> what is this? Um, uh, what is this uh, magical value t that Schwartz says? Well, I'll set it to four for a volume, or two for a two D classification. And uh, so this is something that uh, t multiplies the signal to noise ratio. It's multiplying the signal power, and so it's basically telling the algorithm. Look, my signal to noise ratio is actually t times higher than you, the algorithm, thinks. And it actually makes some sense because um, usually when you reconstruct a volume, the volume does not occupy all that much of the total space of the box. And <clears throat> so it, I think that the t value ought to be the ratio of the particle volume to the box volume. And I think for 2D, the T value ought to be the ratio of the actual particle image area to the total image area. And so if you think about it that way, then T values of 2 and 4 make sense because when Shores computes uh, this tau squared, he is just computing the total squared voxel, the voxel values of the entire box. Any other questions? So if you pick a high T value, you're sort of going out on a limb. You're sort of saying, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, make this deconvolution a little bit sharper, but maybe amplifying more. Okay, it's time. Let's thank Fred for wonderful, of course. <laughs> switch over to Amade and he'll tell us more about algorithms and how we use that in single part of the I've gone way over time. Well, we, we ate into the break, but uh, I think I'll be okay oh, no. because... Oh, I'm sorry. But uh, you, I know you were almost done anyway. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to leave this afternoon. Okay, because yeah. I have a question. You were lectures, but oh. the students come first. Oh, okay. They have questions. Oh, no one's rushing up. Yeah, yeah, so you ask your question. Okay, so the first is that, so the, um, so say Rilao, when it's doing CDF refinement, at the same time,